Bonjour. Good morning. Magandang umaga po. Uh, I'd like to thank the French ambassador for this wonderful invitation to come here today. I'm particularly pleased because it uh, allows me to meet all, some of the people I've interviewed for my book. I assume I, I was invited because I wrote the book on women's movements in the Filipina, which I'm very sorry to say hasn't been republished in the Philippines, but it's not for lack of trying. Excuse me, uh, I want to change, oh, change my microphones. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's not for lack better? Try again. Uh, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, I uh, approached Ateneo University and the, the uh, publisher didn't know it's not working. Hello, mic test, mic test. Yes. Louder. Uh, the publisher wasn't, didn't want to meet with me, and Anvil publisher published, uh, gave me a contract but pulled out six months later. So I'm sorry that there's no Philippine edition of the book. Now, I, uh, Filipino uh, women's movement have been among the most robust in Asia, and it's been very diverse. And one of the critical issues that Filipino feminists had to think about was the Filipino woman. How do you rethink the definition of the Filipino woman? What she is, what she will be, uh, and what will she, she become? And the, uh, think, rethinking the Filipino woman, or how the feminine is defined in the Philippines, has been critical to Filipino feminist theory. And it, and it is the Filipino unique response to the woman question, which is very much different from Western feminism. So due to time constraints, I'm only going to focus on a few salient issues, but I want to add one sector of women which is not, doesn't seem to be included in the program today, and that's Filipino migrant women, based on my current research at the moment. The first one I want to talk about is uh, constructions of the feminine. The definition of the Filip Filipino woman, or the ideal woman in the Philippines, is still wife and mother, and therefore, those who don't live up to this ideal or, or women who are not attached to men are given negative capital. So single women, for example, are seen to be uh, unfulfilled women and are seen to, be, to have failed as women. Uh, I give an example. When I, when I was in my 20s and 30s, uh, uh, when, every time I came back to the Philippines uh, from Australia, my relatives would ask me only one question, may asawa kanaba? Have you got a spouse? Are you married? And the question is, the answer for me would always be no, and everybody would be wringing their fingers and say, kawawa kanaman, you're a person to be pitied uh, because you don't have a husband. And uh, uh, I don't, never go to my high school reunions because uh, th this is also what everyone's going to ask me. Uh, in, I'll give you a big contrast why cultural, the cultural context is very important. Uh, I, we moved, the family moved to Australia when I was 17, and my family doctor, uh, since, since I was a teenager, used to ask me the same question in my 20s and 30s, and that was, have you been promoted to professor yet? So it's a totally different uh, context uh, here from the Philippines and Australia. So uh, I think one of the uh, challenges of the feminist movement today is to, to give, uh, to, to try to disentangle that wife and mother must be the norm and women who don't fit the norm have negative capital and that includes include separated women and, uh, and I will talk about divorce in, a mi uh, uh, divorce in a minute. The other one is cultural co constructions of the feminine see at least uh, this does, I'm not talking about Muslim women here or indigenous women. But the ideal woman for most of Catholic Philippines is the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary as the suffering mother, the Mater Dolorosa. I won't say too much because I know Sister Mary John has published on this and so she's written about it and knows more about it than I, than I do. Uh, but, what, but this encourages women to be dutiful daughters to bear suffering in silence in cases, for example, of domestic violence or psychological abuse if husbands are unfaithful or if husbands abandon them. And, and women being abandoned by husbands is, 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 a, is not, a, a, is a, there's a quite a lot of women who are in this position in the Philippines, uh, cutting across classes. Uh, the idea that women have to be virgins before married and be chaste wives, whereas we know that men are the other of women or women are the other of men, and therefore men are the opposite. They're, they're 
defined as naturally lustful, uh, and therefore it's okay for them to um, have mistresses, but it's not okay uh, for the woman. W women, on the other hand, if men are seen to be naturally lustful, women are denied the right of sex to sexuality. So I think this is another part of the, the way the feminine is defined in the Philippines that needs rethinking and become, it's a challenge for feminists and something that we have, the, the society has to address. Women are supposed to endure, so magtitiis, to endure their plight, and therefore you gain positive capital for being, for, be, for your forbearance, for making the is. So if your husband fools around, it's your fault for not being beautiful enough, and so you get positive capital by enduring it in silence. Feminists in the Philippines have been involved in the project of dismantling this ideal. Uh, Sister Mary Joan has done that by deconstructing the religious roots of women's oppression. Uh, women's health movements uh, have come up with slogans like Hindi kailangan magtiis, which means you don't have to endure. Uh, and um, um, feminist theoreticians like Sister Mary Joan have talked about really, uh, making women assertive. And I remember one of her articles that struck me was that if a woman is assertive, they say mataray, and that's given negative capital, where if it's a guy, they'll say wow, ang galing. So women, uh, we need to restore... Uh, give positive capital to assertive women. The muse of, all, of the feminist movement in the Philippines has always been the babaylan, which is the pre-Hispanic uh, shaman, the woman, wise woman who was past menopause age, who was a spiritual leader and who administered the rituals of the ag agricultural cycle. And this woman has been touted by the feminists in the Philippines as the alternative role model. I think the, the woman as intellectual or scholar has never been part of the grand narrative of the Filipino woman. So I know I will never be considered a, a Filipino woman as, as a scholar. It's not even associated with a Filipino male. Uh, the Babaylan mystique, her imaginative power for the feminists, could be traced to her unique subject position as a mature wise woman with religious power. And these are three uh, characteristics that have yet to be implicated in cultural constructions of the feminine in the Philippines. So uh, women are not defined to be wise or intellectuals or have religious power. Until today, women don't have religious power in the Philippines. Now, I, I want to talk about women de being denied the right to sexuality. Uh, women are imagined not to have sexual desire, and therefore lesbianism uh, is, consider is unfathomable in a society like ours, and that's why we need desperate, we, we, we need activism on behalf of them. And I'm glad we have a very good LGBT activist organizations. Uh, but Filipino masculinity is conflated with virility. So men having mistresses is tolerated since it's imagined that men are naturally lustful. And this cuts across class. Uh, in my current research now on Philippine migration, uh, Filipino seafarers, for example, insert uh, plastic balls in their penises called bolitas, which is supposed to be enhance the sexual pleasure, and they call it the Filipino secret weapon. So you can see men's sexuality is even conflated with ethnic identity among migrants. The fact that we're probably the only country in the world that ever has a book that's a bestseller that's called Etiquette for Mistresses, uh, and made into a blockbuster movie with Chris Aquino in it is quite unique. Uh, uh, women's infidelity, on the other hand, is not tolerated at all. A politician with mistresses is not considered outside the norm, but if there's even a hint of a woman having a sexual affair with a man who's not her husband, then she's severely criticized, so it's clear sexism. Um, the other point is that uh, Western feminist theory has queer theory, but it doesn't always apply to outside uh, to Asia. So there's a fantastic um, Dutch feminist scholar called Saskia Waringa, who has theorized uh, uh, on this issue for the case of India and Indonesia. And she argues that it's com compulsory heteronormativity, or the fact that you have to have a family of a male, female, and children, that, that it discriminates against queer women, women who love women, sex workers in Indonesia, and divorced women in Indonesia. 
Now, it's not always the case, because I know the norm here is that men are, uh, women are not supposed to have sexual desire and are denied the right to sexuality, whereas men are supposed to be naturally lustful. But let me take it to a migra migrant context. If you change the cultural context, uh, the, the definition of the masculine and feminine also changes. So in the 1920s in the United States, in Hawaii, in the 1920s and 20s, Filipino male migrants moved there to work in the sugar plantations. In this context, there were 10 Filipino men to one Filipino woman. And they could not marry outside the ethnic group because of anti-miscegenation laws. In this context, I have got research from di a, a fantastic diary and, and, and uh, memoirs and so on that say that Filipino women at that time could have three husbands and a lover and get away with it. Uh, and, in, and in fact, it was, uh, they had, what do you call it, the power in the marriage game, the ultimate power in the marriage game. They didn't get l less status because of that, and the men had to deal with it because they couldn't find a wife otherwise. Uh, one of the memoirs by a male sugar plantation worker said, I finally found a woman, she had a boyfriend that she lived with, uh, but, but then he went back to the Philippines, so now I've got her. Even if she's secondhand, at least I have a wife. The sexist uh, label of the woman as secondhand is a terrible thing, but the fact that he, had, he, he, he felt grateful that he actually even had a wife uh, is an interesting point. Now, these women, uh, who in the Philippines would be considered transgressing women, these women actually paid the price of their sexual rights or, uh, because uh, I saw, a, uh, I've read a diary of a 12 year old where her father who was a sugar plantation worker, uh, discovered her mother in bed with her lover in flagrante delicto and beat her up and had the wife jailed. But at the end of the story, he could not take back his wife. She still went along and left and, and went with her lover. So uh, women were able to uh, exercise the right of sexuality, but they did have to pay a heavy price for it in the 1920s in Hawaii. So, so my point is that a change in cultural context also means you can change definitions of the feminine and sexuality. Uh, another point I want to say is there is a lack of an, there is no absolute divorce in the Philippines, and it's probably one of the few countries in the world without one. Here, it's not. Uh, sorry? The only country in the world, thank you, Analea, the only country in the world without one. Uh, and I know here it's not, it's, not, it's not a topic people always bandy about, in, but when I tell this to my students enrolled in my classes in Asian studies and University of New South Wales and, or in the Women in Southeast Asia course, they're absolutely horrified and they can't believe it. They keep, is it true? No, it can't be. Uh, but, but if but if you look at the cultural context in which men's infidelity is tolerated and even lauded, I mean, if a, if a man has a lot of mistresses, then he, he must be a lot of power because he's the, the ideal masculine guy. I always tell the story of my uncle, Congressman Rosses, who had six mistresses and simultaneously and children with all of them. I only found out 10 years ago that I actually had a cousin in Holland who's like 45. Uh, and... Um, when he was running for re-election, they, they put uh, sheets around saying that my, you know, Congressman Rosses has uh, six mistresses and one of them is a La Bandera. And my grandfather spent the whole time trying to get rid of these posters all around Manila, but he got re-elected because they thought he was democratic. You know, the mistress was a washerwoman and he was a rich guy. So, but that would never happen uh, if it was a woman. Women with philandering husbands are expected to remain chaste wives and to endure. So I think not having absolute divorce is unfair to women. Uh, uh, reproductive rights has already been brought up, so I won't talk about it. Politics has been brought up, but what I would add to the debate is that in, in, uh, f uh, the way political power is constructed in the Philippines, women are the dominant view, this does not include a female politicians in the room today, the dominant view is that women exercise power through ties with male politicians. So wives of politicians, uh, sisters, mothers, daughters, access power, if you look at the pattern, uh, they enter political office, but previously they were the wife, daughter, sister, uh, mother of a politician. Or they are wives of politicians, but because Filipino concepts of power malakas see that the whole family is powerful, not just the person in office, then the wife uh, is seen to be powerful as well. 
Now, in the Western democratic viewpoint, this power that the wife exercises is illegitimate because she was not elected. It was the husband or the male relative that was elected. But I want to pose a challenge to feminists today that illegitimate or not, illegitimate or not it's still power. And since women uh, have, you know, are disadvantaged in formal politics as it is, I think it's something that feminists should think about using. If we, if we, if we, if we only... Uh, turned all these wives of politicians into feminists, we might be able to uh, uh, harness this power. The other point about politics is that there, there is no women's vote. Women do not vote for women just because they're women. And this is a challenge for us feminists. We should get women to vote for our women politicians, especially those who are willing to change the law. Laws mentioned today, for example, that, that's to the advantage of women. Another point is the connection between beauty and power. In the Western feminist framework, they want to dismantle beauty queen images because they don't want women to be objects of desire, objects of the male gaze, and Western feminists are against the objectification of women. But in the Philippines, beauty queens can translate to power, and powerful women are reinvented as beautiful. So it's a challenge. I've analyzed this. It's because I think beautiful women are associated with virtue. When you're bringing up a little kid, you don't tell them, don't do that, it's bad. You tell them, wag mong gamunyan, it's pangit, you know, it's ugly. So the, uh, you don't say, is that a great project? You say, maganda bayon, is it a beautiful project? So since beauty and virtue in our language and culture is connected, uh, then that's why there, it, it, it partially explains why the connection between beauty and women's beauty and women's power are connected. But I think in the Philippine case, it's this kind of a bit of an obsession with beauty contest, even by the diaspora, Filipino maids in Hong Kong, because they, are, they can't put on makeup, jewelry, and they're policed at home because the uh, madame is afraid that the husband might fall in love with them. So in, in their houses, they're restricted in trying to be beautiful. So on Sundays, they get all dressed up and have a beauty contest. Uh, the fact that we in the Philippines cannot even celebrate the centennial of our independence, Philippine independence from Spain, without having a Miss Centennial's Philippines contest, which, which I, Miss Philippines Centennial, which I assume the winner will reign for 100 years, uh, is a sign that uh, we do have this little bit of an obsession with, with beauty and the connection with uh, and if a and if husband has a mistress, everyone says it's the wife's fault because she wasn't beautiful enough. Another, to move out of politics, women hold the purse strings in the Philippines, so they have economic power. Uh, so this is different from the West, where the Western liberal feminism fought for uh, the women to have economic power. But Filipino women do have this. But of course, it's, it's challenging because if you're not very wealthy, then if you're poor, it's very difficult to stretch the funding. It's quite stressful. Uh, but on the other hand, the fact that men surrender their paychecks to the wives who give them allowance for beer and cigarettes mean that women can, can have power. And I'll talk a little bit about, little bit about in a minute, about how women do have power as consumers. Uh, now, feminists in the Philippines have been fantastic in using the media, radio, and television to disseminate the way they're rethinking the Filipino woman. Television shows in the 80s, Woman Watch, XYZ Television, where Senator Hontiveros was an anchor. Radio shows coming from St. Scholasticus, run by Sister Mary John, Tinig ng Nursha and Kape at Chica, Gabriela's OK Kamare and Babae Kamayseka, and Women's Media Circles, XY Zone. This is unique to uh, worldwide. Uh, and so the Philippine women's movements have made a major contribution in having women's studies courses imparted through radio and television to disseminate feminist ideas and critically, critically reflect on women's issues and feminist debates. Gabriela has an excellent track record in fashioning women, as mentioned earlier, uh, in dealing and training women to be activists uh, by giving gender sensitivity seminars, getting women's workers to organize in their fabulous uh, uh, fortes in protest and supporting women of all sectors. Uh, women's movements are divided sectorially, so, uh, and also the Filipino feminist theory is, locates Filipino women in grassroots women, so there has been a focus that cuts across class with a focus on lower class women. So what would I think is the ongoing current challenge for us feminists today? I think the first thing is we need to think about not just rethinking the Filipino woman, but I think we should think about remaking Filipino masculinity since men are the other of women. 
I think the, 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 the fact that men, the, the notion that men can have lots of girlfriends and get away with it, uh, and the connection between male, male virility and masculinity needs to be given negative capital. Men with mistresses should not be admired. Women who, men who abandon their wives should not be able to get away with it. Uh, uh, and, and so our upbringing, since we are mothers teaching children, should socialize it so that men do uh, housework or domestic tasks. So you never see a Filipino guy uh, doing childcare. Uh, the solution for elite families here is to hire a domestic worker. And I know among migrants, when the woman is working abroad, it's not the husband that looks after the kids, but the uh, female relatives. So we need to get men to do domestic work uh, as well. Women do have powers as consumers. Over 50% of the majority of subscribers to the Filipino channel, uh, or 40% of the revenue of the mothership ABS-CBN, uh, uh, is a woman. So uh, Rafi Lopez, the CEO of, of the Filipino channel, has told me that it, their, their consumer is a woman about 50 years old. Filipino women's addiction to Tagalog romance novels have catapulted that genre to bestsellers in forever altering the history of the book in the Philippines. In Lucky Plaza, Singapore, Filipino domestic workers claimed that, that mall as their space and, and people think that they're, they're a marginal group. Um, I have a colleague who's a Singaporean and she insulted me by saying that the, the presence of Filipino domestic workers in La, uh, Lucky Plaza cheapens the place. I, I, want, I should have said that was a racist comment. Uh, Sister Mary John would not be proud of me because nothing came out of my mouth. I was so outraged. Uh, but whatever she says, Philip, that is Filipino space. Businesses compete for the Filipino dollar and for Filipino clientele. And, and so they do have uh, Filipinos who make houses, real, buy condominiums in, 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 in Metro Manila or have little Italy houses in, in the provinces. Uh, this is cons uh, consumer power. So finally, I just want to talk about migrants as, as forefront in the agents of change. We're talking about agents of change here. There's that lovely Tagalog blockbuster movie called It Takes a Man and a Woman on, uh, where Sarah Geronimo plays a woman called Lida Magtalas who goes to Canada and comes back and says, I'm Lida 2.0. Uh, uh, presenting herself as a, uh, 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 using the linguistic marker for updated computer software. Migrants have the chance to reinvent themselves because they go to a different cultural context and they re-examine re themselves. I gave you the Hawaii uh, um, example early. The other one is that there are lots of examples of infidelity abroad. I've read a lot of uh, memoirs of Filipino domestic workers and they do talk about having one day stand since they don't have the night off. Uh, Lucky Plaza is also a pickup place. They've got boyfriends that cut across class, Bangladeshi men, and so on. Uh, and so they do now accept well, um, these women have husbands in the Philippines, so therefore uh, they, do, uh, um, ac they do now have sexual rights. So the women broke taboos in several ways. Uh, while women's adultery is not tolerated in the Philippines, they are doing it. Uh, they asserted women's sexuality and sexual agency outside of marriage. Uh, and they debunked the myth of the chaste wife. And thirdly, they knew that these new liaisons would not be connected to forming families. So they disengaged romance with creating a family. Uh, all these women are also philanthropic. If you look at philanthropic work, it's dominated by women. Women are the ones involved in civic work and charity, helping in natural disasters and so on. Finally, since this is a France-Philippine symposium, I wanted to end with the story of Sita Obra, a Filipino domestic worker in France, whose story is an example of the everyday ways women empower themselves with some, hope from the, with some help from the host country. So I've got an example from Italy and France here. Uh, um, Sita was born in Pangasinan. She stopped her schooling at sixth grade in 1976 because the parents were poor and they needed her to work. She went to Manila at the age of 13 and became a maid. She got married, had two children, and went to France in 1994 as a domestic worker uh, illegally. Her employers only paid her for 2,000 francs after 11 months out of her monthly salary of 6,000 francs because the employers claimed that deductions were to pay for the lawyers who were working on her papers. When she discovered that nothing had been done to process her case, she confronted her employers and demanded her pass passport. When nothing happened, she took legal action, becoming the first Filipina in France to file a case against her employer on the grounds of modern slavery. 
She took her case to the French Union who provided her with a lawyer and she was awarded with 45,000 francs. She took it up further to the Court of Appeal where she got her, all her due salary including interest. Her efforts made her a celebrity in France. She was featured in a magazine, the French television company accompanied her to the Philippines when she visited and, and when the Philippine, and the Philippine embassy never helped her but the, the first lady of France answered her letter. After her victory, she got a job with the French Union. They taught her French. And, it, and, and when in, in her, my interview with her, she told her story with an enormous amount of pride and her awareness of her metamorphosis from a domestic worker with primary school qualifications to a union advocate of all exploited workers. Cecilia Silva was born in 1957 in Laguna. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Commerce and worked as a line leader in the production of Westinghouse in Canlubang. She joined her sister in Italy as a babysitter, moved to Paris, had a French boyfriend, had a child, female child with him, and she went back to Italy and became an officer of the Filipino community Padova chapter. She became an active member of the Equal Opportunities Commission of Padova and was elected to the Consigli della Comunità Stranieri di Padova and president of the Equal Opportunities Sector. She acts as a translator for the police and court cases where Filipinos are involved. She founded Associazione Donna Filipina, an organization that specializes in diasporic philanthropic work to the Philippines. In recognition of her achievements, she got the Bagong Bayani Award from the Philippines. The short biographies of these two exceptional women migrants reveal that both made most of the opportunities offered by the host countries and that a different cultural context also changes how the feminine is defined. It's true that some of their, their qualifications were not recognized. Cecilia Silva had a college degree but could only get employment as a domestic worker in Italy. But like many Filipino workers overseas, she was forced to de-skill. But she refused to be defined solely by her occupation. She immersed herself in civic work, holding multiple roles. And in her citation for her Bagong Bayani Award, it, no, no mention was made of her occupation. She has metamorphosized into an activist, philanthropist, and civic leader. Like Cecilia, Zita has reinvented herself from domestic worker to professional union advocate in France. Both women are important actors in their communities overseas and recognized by Filipino communities abroad. But both women are also divorced. Sita has remarried. And both women do not fit the ideal of the Virgin Mary, Mater Dolorosa, suffering in silence. Both women are very assertive and both women are very intelligent. They have proposed their own role models and both ordinary women have achieved milestones in the extraordinary task of redefining the Filipino woman. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Maraming salamat po.